Welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast with your host, Scott McMahon. Hi, and welcome to the Film Trooper Podcast, filmmaking freedom for the independent. Today's episode is sponsored by the book, How to Make and Sell Your Film Online and Survive the Hollywood Implosion While Doing It. It's available in paperback, as a Kindle ebook, and an audiobook. In fact, you can get the audiobook for free when you sign up with audible.com for 30 days. Just go to survivetheimplosion.com. That's survivetheimplosion.com. Okay, today's episode is entitled, How to Get a Distribution Deal. And I'm joined by two members of the filmmaking team that just released onto iTunes and Google Play and a bunch of other platforms. I think they're on like Xbox and PlayStation and things like that. The raunchy American comedy, The Bet. Chris J is the co-writer and co-producer, and as you'll hear, the person who is responsible for getting the money to make this film. And Chris is joined by his producing partner, Reza Riazi. So in this interview, you'll discover how these filmmakers secure the financing for their film, what steps they took to get famous wrestlers to star in the film, how they were able to work in favors from their crew, and of course, how they went about landing a distribution deal. I really enjoyed this interview, and I think every filmmaker out there can take away a lot of value from these guys' experience. So without further ado, here are Chris J. and Reza Riazzi from the movie The Bet here on the Film Trooper Podcast. Yeah, uh, My name is Chris J., and uh, I am the co-writer and the co-producer of the new uh, indie comedy The Bet. Very cool. And then we have uh, Reza. You want to introduce yourself and give us a little rundown of your involvement with The Bet as well? Yeah, sure thing. I'm uh, Reza Riazzi, and I'm the producer of the bet. All right, great. So, between both you, so we're on, we're doing this on a Skype call, and we're not seeing each other. So, but it's a group call, and uh, so I'm in the elevator. You know how it is. Exp- <laughs> give me the pitch of what the bet is, like, or like you're you're enthusiastically want to share, like you just made this movie, but if somebody goes, oh, okay, what's it about? Yeah, um, it is an it is not a highbrow vehicle, Scott. Um, this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is an old school kind of fun, silly kind of throwback comedy. Um, and it tells the story of a guy named Denton Baker who has gets in a high stakes bet where he has one summer to not only find every girl he had a crush on from first grade to 12th grade, but he also has to find a way to hook up with each of these crushes and hopefully hilarity ensues. Yeah. There he goes. And what's at, what's at stake with the bet? Is it or is that does that reveal too much of the story? Like, why would somebody go through uh, the the arduous task of trying to <laughs> basically sleep with every crush she had since what kindergarten? Yeah, yeah. You want to take that, Reza? Yeah, it's a uh, as as a story like this would tend to have the uh, the stakes are of course winning back your father's gourmet condom company that was taken <laughs> away from him. Okay, so if, uh, like you said, we're not going high brow. We're going. This is where we're going. <laughs> yeah. It goes. It goes straight to that, which yeah. is actually one of my favorite things about it. Because if you read the log line and you think that's going to be funny and silly, then you're most likely going to really like the movie. <laughs> if you read it and don't, you probably shouldn't watch it. But also, I think we get like five cents or something every time, so maybe you still can. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, he's trying to win back his father's gourmet condom company that was taken from him. And if he loses, he loses him and his father's house, which is literally the last possession that they have. Okay, yeah. So it's sort of like that. So like that sort of like, but it reminds me of those who want to, like uh, Billy Madison. You know, where yeah. Adam Sandler, yeah. like he has to learn and edu- get himself, you know, an education in order to inherit his dad's business. Otherwise, somebody else is going to take it. Okay, cool. Yeah, and honestly, Scott, you kind of hit the nail on the head. This is like a raunchy, dirtier version of Billy Madison. Like, if you like that silly comedy, but you need a little more profanity, um, that's kind of what we set out to do. So tell me, how did this story or this movie project come together? Like, uh, who was the first in, and then how did the team uh, sort of build from there? Yeah, so basically my background uh, really quick is I am in the band Army of Freshmen. So um, I was – Army of Freshmen is one of those indie bands. Some people know us. Some people don't. We would open up for the bigger bands and and be out there on the road in a van, and we toured the world, but we never made any money. Um, so basically right around the time the music industry collapsed, you know, when everything just went upside down and downloading got crazy and labels started going out of business, I kind of took a re- – reexamined my life and said I just probably 
am not going to be able to make a living doing this. So uh, I had the idea to write a movie. I lived in California. Um, I had been a freelance writer, had a silly idea for a movie in my head, and, and I figured I- I'm just going to try and write a screenplay. I mean, no education, no film school. I'm literally just going to try and write a movie. So I brought my partner, Aaron, who was in Army of Freshmen as well, the guitar player. And the first thing I did was called Reza because Reza had produced one of our music videos. So he was kind of like my only contact in the world of film. You know, he was an indie film producer. And uh, he literally guided us through the whole process of screenwriting just as a friend. I mean, there was no ideas to actually make this a movie. We just kind of wanted to say that we wrote a screenplay so we could be like every other idiot running around Los Angeles waiting tables telling somebody, I wrote a movie, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So... Um, we took a long time to write it just here and there. We learned the whole process. We didn't know what final draft was. I mean, it was like rookie all the way. And at a certain point, um, it got to the point with the script with Reza kind of giving us updates and ideas where Reza, who had kind of taken a little sabbatical from the industry, said, you know what? I I think we could make this. He was like, I I think we could actually make a real low budget indie comedy if we used a lot of favors and friends and we shot in your hometown. And initially, and Reza can agree, like our vision, Reza, was for honestly a much smaller movie. The idea that this would get distribution and be released and have a little buzz is kind of beyond our wildest dreams. But um, you can kind of take it from there, Reza, because he was the guy that actually got this project off the ground. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's it's funny because because Chris had mentioned that before that his vision was a little bit smaller, and to me, I thought their vision was much bigger than what it should have been. <laughs> uh, but I more mean that on like a production level, like it's not because they're first time writers, which I actually thought this was a good part of it. They didn't write themselves into a one room movie or anything like that. They actually wrote a movie that has a ton of locations and a ton of casts and uh, made us really work for it. Mm -hmm. But it comes across on screen. It doesn't feel like a super small flick. Um, The other side of it, honestly, I kind of always knew we'd get it distributed. It was, uh, I had taken a sabbatical from the industry for a little bit, but this is the sixth film I've done and I've, I've had distribution for everyone before that. And I knew the industry was changing and distro had changed because everything I'd done before that was all DVD. And I know that's kind of dead now, but I kind of always knew in my gut that we'd find a home for this thing and we'd get it out and people would see it. And it wouldn't just like live in our living rooms, if that makes any sense. And it was hard. It was harder than I actually thought because everything had changed so much. But uh, we were able to get it out, man. Nice. So when you decided like, okay, I'm going to, let's make this happen. What is the, what was the first component of building the team? Was it the actors? Was it the director? What, in kind of like a little bit, as much as you can, kind of step by step of like how things evolved and that, what, you know, what path that led you down to uh, uh, unforeseen happy accidents and things like that. Uh, You know, this movie, honestly, Scott, it's, it's a wild story, not, the plot just how the thing was made and i think a lot of people hear the plot and they kind of which is a wild story by the way the plot for the record (laughs) yeah Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) but i think they kind of negate the fact that it's still just because you make a silly movie it doesn't take away any of the work and and effort that that a serious movie would be you know and i think that kind of gets lost sometimes because you know reza and i went through hell and high water to get this thing done um, and the, the first, the first step was Reza says, we can make this. I'm like, you're crazy. I, I had my head up my ass, man. I thought we were just, let's make a trailer. Like I'm coming from the music business, you know, right, like right. make a demo and then go to the label and get a deal, you know? And Reza's like, it's not really like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, he said, let's try and make it. But he said fundraising. He was like, we got to find a way to find the funds for this. We're not trust fund kids. We're, we're, we're guys that, you know, work, uh, you know, part-time jobs. So uh, Reza helped put together a little pitch pack. What would you say, like a five-page kind of pamphlet, Reza? Yeah, yeah, just like a standard deck or something to try to go out and get people interested in this. Yeah, and I took that and I just started, uh, you know, I initially went to the parents, to be completely honest with you. Um, they um, are, are not well-to-do by any means, but they were excited for the, the the fact that we were trying to pull this off. And they gave us a couple thousand dollars. And what we did with that, Scott, was we, we took that thousand dollars almost as like seed money. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, let's 
use this money to take a little bit of time, right, and, and try and find more money, basically. You know, like and take also, a- sorry, just to interject really quickly, almost because it's so funny. <laughs> we use that also to tell people, we've already got one investor on board. Right, you know, right, to, right, right. To get people more excited because nobody wants to be first money in. So we'd go around and be like, and, you know, we already have one investor for a decent amount and not exactly say how much it is to see if it would uh, – if yeah. get their interest, but uh, yeah. but keep going, Chris. Yeah, the decent <laughs> amount was twenty five hundred dollars. You know right, what right. I mean? Um, but we, uh, um, I, I started just searching everywhere and and really turning over every rock and talking to anybody and saying, would you know anybody that would be into this? And you have to understand, again, it came from a much more impassioned kind of creative, wild place because we weren't filmmakers. Uh, Aaron and I weren't right. Mm-hmm. So. Um, we, the dot that we connected was we had some friends of a friend over in the United Kingdom, oddly enough, who we knew had produced a friend of ours musical. And, and we were aware that musicals are obviously, you know, big budget productions at any level. So, um, you know, they're a casual friend. They knew us through the band. Uh, I knew that they were coming to the United States and we had like, what Reza, like $400 left. And we said, Dude, Chris. Yeah, which is really funny because I was trying to remember the other day why we only had four hundred dollars left, but we really <laughs> did. We're down to like the last four hundred somehow. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, we, I bought a, the cheapest plane ticket I could find. I flew out to Disney World, the Florida one, and uh, the uh, this this uh, family was vacationing there, and they were kind enough to sit down for a lunch. And I brought the script. I pitched them on the idea. I pitched them on the project. I, I left them a script. And uh, I think they were just excited by my my passion and my energy for it. I, I don't think it was necessarily they, – they looked at this and said, wow, this is going to be a massive film. You know, I think it was more like, wow, could you really pull this off? And uh, a couple weeks later, we got an email that they would be willing to come on as executive uh, producers. And, you know, Reza had put together a small micro budget and they were willing to back it. And, and boom, we were – off and running and we didn't have a lot of time uh, at that point because Reza was pretty adamant about filming I'm talking to you in uh, uh, the in the fall of 2013 and we wanted to film right at the top of 2014 so at that point Reza just started putting the team together so I'm sure you can film in on the next step Reza yeah before Um, before we get there I was curious like what do you think the um, um, besides the deck do you think they were what do you think was the kind of the turning point for this particular investor, which is a friend of a friend, friend of a friend, to make that pull the trigger and say, "Yeah, let's let me back this." And because usually sometimes when people get those uh, meetings or incidents uh, or things that happen where somebody's committing, but you know nothing's really there until like money's in the bank or in escrow or you know things like that. So how do you? What do you think was sort of the the turning point in or what did you see in terms of the meeting that somebody could take away? That another filmmaker can go, is it confidence in the room? Is it just passion behind the project? Or what was the what was the connection? Because uh, this particular person could be interested in dramas and historical documentaries or something that had no interest in comedy. So what what do you think was the connection there when you were making uh, that meeting happen? Uh, Scott, and and I would say to other filmmakers, I just think it was pure, unbridled passion. I mean, I came across that this was my life's goal to try and make this film, and I just had such enthusiasm for it um, that I I think that was the key thing. I mean, uh, the the investors in the project, they're actually, you know, a lot more highbrow, you know what Mm -hmm. I mean? They're know, incredibly smart, wonderful, educated people, but they probably would lean more towards uh, a serious drama than a raunch comedy. But man, I was just wildly passionate that I was going to find a way to do this thing. And I think that infectious energy, at least from people that maybe are new to film, is is an exciting thing. I mean, would you agree, Reza? Yeah, I was I was even going to say I wasn't actually at that meeting because, again, we only had we only had the dough to send one person at that right. point. And also, we didn't want to bombard them either with like, all right, and now we're all here. Please give us some money uh, just because they're so sweet. And they were getting friends of friends. But one thing I can say is like if you had sat at a table with Chris and he went on without telling you what the plot of the movie was and just how he wants to make this movie 
you'd be like, oh my god, this is going to be one of those Sundance flicks where everybody cries at the end. And then you'd be like, what's, what's the plot? And yeah. then he would tell you the plot. You'd be like, wait, what? But I mean that in a really good way. Like, if you're a filmmaker out there, you know, don't be apologetic about your project, no matter what that project is, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. It's like, don't don't think you have to be that Sundance movie that makes everybody cry or else nobody will care. Uh, as long as you care about it, you'll find somebody who reads that and will be like, you know what, let's just do it. Yeah. Was there any interest, was there any uh, unique questions that were asked of you from the investors or this group, or this family uh, that, um, that was interesting to you or, or was like a turning point or how do you, how did you react to certain questions or was it just simply, they just sat, listen, you just went off. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a lot of them sitting and listening and uh, and I went off. Um, one thing that we did have, which I think is very important, Reza opted to prepare three budgets. Um, and I believe I presented them along with the script and, and, the, and the deck, um, three different budgets. Because Reza said, let's make this no matter what. We can make it at this level, this level, or this level. And, and Reza, correct me if I'm wrong, did they opt for the, they opt for the, the 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 bigger one am i right the middle one the middle one well because okay. also because one of them was like much bigger like hey also if for some reason you just want to spend all your money we mm. can do this <laughs> but but yeah they went they went right in the middle but yeah. you know one of the one of the things that they were interested in from the beginning and and this should be really eye-opening to any filmmaker out there because this isn't something that your mind usually goes to when you want to make a movie they asked a lot about what's going to happen afterwards and not you know they were kind of not to be saying like oh how many millions of dollars will this make because i don't think they were ever tricked into thinking that would be the case but they asked about publicity a lot like hey how are you guys going to promote this thing after what how are you guys going to try and get people to even hear about it uh do you have a social media plan like things like that they were they they're kind of from that world but mm -hmm. It's really one of the most important and understated parts of all of it is, you know, even simply this, talking to you on this podcast right now, uh, a lot of people don't think about that from the jump, and you really should. That should be part of your plan that you're presenting to people. Yeah, it's interesting because I read somewhere that sometimes investors, um, when they're looking at the, the deck and the pitch deck, and that sometimes it's just the, the line item that says you get to be part of the red carpet premiere. Like totally. that, that's like the only reason like oh yeah i'm in like everything else doesn't matter but it's it's i was curious was there something in there that that was like the moment that like oh yeah cool that's what i want to be part of <laughs> well you know and this, and this one was a little different you you're totally dead on where a lot of and obviously i've i've been part of other other fundraisings as well and sometimes that's it sometimes you've got somebody who has a lot of money and wants to just be like okay cool i can i can be at this red carpet premiere i can go to this festival uh, which again, we can talk about later. Our, our movie is definitely not a festival movie, but, right, right. uh, but sometimes that's the thing. I, I don't think that was the case with them, but they are in the arts and maybe it felt like another thing that they kind of add to the artistic resume of like, Hey, you know, we also made this movie. Um, but I really do think it was, it was more the passion. They just wanted to be part of something cool and interesting and they could tell that Chris was going to execute it. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was a lot of faith, all things considered, Scott. I mean, mm -hmm. especially I had never I mean, I'm a guy coming from the world of music. I mean, that's insane. That's like a plumber saying, hey, I'd like to put the roof on your house. Like, mm -hmm. great. You know, have you ever put a roof on? Nope. But God damn it. I've done some plumbing. You know, it's like <laughs> so um, they had a lot of faith. And I mean, obviously, we're very, very grateful and we're very lucky that we were able to find them. And one of the things they, they definitely wanted to make sure was very clear that they were the sole executive producers. And I think that goes to the fact that they have a lot of projects. And like Reza said, they wanted to probably diversify just a little bit. Hey, we've got some theater productions. We have a lot of stuff like that in play. Hey, maybe we add a, a film. And if maybe that there's some success, maybe that's a new branch for them. So I think it was definitely... Um, an experiment for them in a lot of ways too. And I think maybe they enjoyed taking the plunge of, Hey, this guy's jumping into something that he hasn't done. Let's invest in something we haven't been involved in before and, and ultimately see what happens. So that I think there was a lot of fun all around. And if any filmmaker can present that and find that type of investor that appreciates that, because a lot of them are all bottom line, dollar, this dollar, that, 
Um, you know, we were told, right, Reza, by several people to look for friends, look for family, look for people that you have a relationship with because you're just not big enough to get money from someone established because they're just going to be bitter. They're not going to see the excitement and the joy of a micro budget movie. You know? Yeah, interesting. How did you guys answer those questions about uh, promotion? Uh, like when they brought it to you, did you did, were you prepared with an answer, or did you? How did you guys handle that? Well, we were very. Um, the whole social media thing's coming up a lot, and I know Reza can talk about that when he talked to some distribution companies. Like people are obsessed with those social numbers, and quite frankly, a lot of those are blown up and and kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. But. But, I mean, everybody's obsessed with that. It's not even like who's in the cast. It's like what's the social media of the cast. I mean, we were passed on by a major distro company solely because of our social numbers, right, Reza? So they, they were very concerned about social media and they understood the importance of it. And we tried to, on our very, very limited budget, assemble a cast with some cameos, especially using the wrestlers, um, that had some social media base because I think a lot of indies our size cast some wonderful actors, but they have no online presence. And we tried to balance that a little bit. So even going in, we said we had a vision to put some cameos in into the film. And a movie like ours, you're able to do that. And I think that kind of paid off and it is paying off right now. Yeah. So you got the um – you come back from this meeting, uh, how quick was the turnaround where it was like, it was definitely a go. And then how did you guys deal with the emotions or, um, did you have like a short, like, you know, two hour celebration and then you were right to work, <laughs> then you were right to work, you know, like, like what was the next steps to, to call in favors and then actually start assembling the team that's going to make the movie? Um, I mean, we, I can't remember what the exact turnaround was from the time that Chris went to Florida to the time that they sent the email saying we're dead in. It, but... it was, it was, a, it was a couple weeks. It was like two to three weeks, I believe, cause they sent it to the wrong, they sent it to my old email and I didn't even get it. So I got another email yeah, saying, right. Hey, do you get our email? Cause these people said that they're in to invest in our film. Right. And I didn't yeah. even write them back. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, but we were obviously ecstatic, but we had already kind of started a lot of the pre-production and Reza just boom, started putting the team together. And I think you went for the director first, right Reza? Yeah. Well, director and, uh, I can't remember if John, the DP, which one came on first, but I want to say director. The director was Ryan Edder, and it was his first feature, but I had known him a little bit now, and I'd seen a like this web series that he did for like literally five dollars or something. like uh, and and I'd really enjoyed it. and I, he it was a comedy, but the thing I liked is that he didn't shoot it like a comedy, if that makes any sense. Uh-huh. So he actually treated it kind of like the way you would have shot it if it was a drama, like actual thought out shots and things like that. And not just high key light. It was actually kind of moody. Uh, and I really dug that because that's one of the things I think, you know, it's starting to you're starting to see a little bit more of it. But up until now, there are very few comedic directors who actually try to make it look like a real movie. And that was important, at least to me at the time. Right. Um, right. So we brought on Ryan and we met at a, uh, a, a high stakes meeting at a Denny's with Chris and Aaron, <laughs> a big Hollywood Denny's meeting. And then, uh, they, they like, they loved them too. And we brought him on. And then from there, John Schmidt, who shot the movie, he was like the next big piece. Uh, I'd known him for years. He was a second unit DP on the only feature I ever directed, which was like seven years ago. And I knew he's immensely talented. He'd done a bunch of work up until that point. But we always stayed in touch and we'd done a few projects together and he was willing to come in uh, more or less as a favor. And one of the big pieces of that is he also owned his own Alexa, which oh, wow. is an uncommon camera to have. Yeah. And because of that, I mean, it, it looks incredible. I mean, it's, it's not just the Alexa. He's honestly a really, really great DP, but um, we knew those pieces would be big. So we brought him, and then we just went from there. We started staffing and calling in favors. We purposely shot in uh, February. We were actually aiming for end of January. It ended up pushing by a couple of weeks. But for no, those who are... It was, uh, it was uh, uh, end of January, beginning of February. Okay, yeah. So for those who are outside the industry, that's actually... 
or maybe even inside the industry, that's the best time to try to get crew because it's kind of a downtime for all the big shows. They don't really run at those times. You kind of die out during the holidays and you pick back up like end of February, early March. Um, so I knew that I'd be able to pull in a lot of favors just because there'd simply be guys who'd say, yeah, screw it. I'm not on something and I've known you for a while and this sounds fun and I'll do it, you know, for less than what my normal rate is and still get really high talented people. Right. Was there any point in the conversation that, uh, that Chris would direct just cause he wrote it and he, he got the funding and did everything else? You, you know, I don't think that ever officially came up and I can't speak for Chris and maybe there was part of him who thought maybe that, but also the other thing is we always treated it going back to what Chris said a little bit bigger. And one of the things that I can't overstate is if you're a first time filmmaker, don't try to be that triple threat, quadruple threat person, not because you're not capable of it, maybe, but you just get such a better product when somebody is focusing on one thing because there's so much going on, especially when you don't have a bunch of money. Uh, and I think Chris got that from the beginning, but maybe he had a secret desire that uh, <laughs> you know, I told him well, well, for, direct for, it. For the record, Scott, Reza actually did present that very early on before we got the money. Like, hey, would that be an option? Would you want to do that? But I think I was um, I, I don't want to say smart enough, but I was aware that that was way out of my league, you know, and so uh, funny. I don't remember doing that, but you're probably right. I probably did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Reza. I appreciate that. No and problem. now having gone through the process, I am. I am brutally aware of what a horrible mistake that would have been, you know, so I'm glad that I didn't even try and go down that road, even though for a second I'm like, well, that would be kind of cool. But um, there were so many hats to wear and I did so many multiple things and Reza did so many multiple things. I don't think there was either way for Reza or I to throw that hat on as well. I just we just surrounded ourselves with great people in each position, and, and that really paid off a, a lot. Because actually, not to not to switch this back to uh, back to what Chris forgot now, but when Chris <laughs> and Aaron originally approached me, they had actually asked if I would produce and direct because mm -hmm. I I had directed a feature, and to be honest, from that experience, I knew it's just better if you have somebody focusing. So yeah, you're I, right. I yeah. told them that same thing. I said, you know, I I just don't want to because I've been producing for long enough now that I think that's where my best fit is and we should find somebody whose best fit is directing and go from there. And when he brought us uh, Ryan, the director, I mean, we're like thinking like, oh man, don't we want somebody a little more established? You know, um, not that we had the money to do that, but we sat down with him at Denny's, like he said, and Ryan literally said, if you hire me, I will quit my job and I will spend months of my life working on this project and I will kill for it. And that's all Aaron and I needed to hear because we came from that sort of DIY, hardworking, risk everything background. Mm -hmm. So instead of having some guy that maybe's done a couple features or and was just trying to do a cash grab, he was essentially willing to work for nothing and he was willing to quit his job. And he's still in the mix with us to this day. He was there for every step of the project because it was his first film. So I feel like we got a lot of first time energy and we got a lot of people that weren't bitter and i would say we had that in a lot of different positions in the film right reza all things considered yeah yeah i mean uh minus minus actual like the hard nuts and bolts crew they were actually pretty seasoned guys like from our dp to our gaffer ac all that kind of stuff they were they were nice and seasoned but yeah we had a lot of as you need for movies like this we had a lot of first time people uh even running some of the small departments like wardrobe and things like that uh, just because they had the passion for it. Yep. Now, did um, by getting uh, Ryan on as director, did he choose uh, John as a cinematographer, like you mentioned, or was it a group effort? Like, did you present John to Ryan and say, what about this guy? Or how, how did how did the because a lot of times you hear in indie, the indie film world, just like a lot of people struggle with ineffective or bad crews so how do you assemble a team um you know knowing that you're trying to create a really harmonious and uh productive a uh, group in a short amount of time i i know i had presented him with it i know earlier i said i couldn't remember who i brought on first and even if i talked to john about it i w wouldn't have officially brought him on to it without having a director of course um but i know now thinking back to that i presented because i remember ryan had some dps that he knew that i obviously didn't know um that he was like you know what about this guy what about that guy 
but honestly, I just had such a long relationship with John. John's work is so good that it kind of speaks for itself. And then I set them up on a phone call so they could talk about the project. And Brian pretty much bought into him from that point. He was okay. like, yeah, this is this is 100% the guy. I mean, they started talking about different style for it and different shot ideas that John already had and things like that. And from that point, Ryan was 100% on board. Gotcha. So what's then, uh, as you know, as quickly as possible, not, you know, you don't have to go into too much detail, but how did you, once the got the ball, ball rolling and, you know, what was your casting process like? And then just any sort of fun stories about the production stuff. And I've obviously, you know, uh, for Chris to be like, oh, my God, this is happening. We're making a movie. It's like my words are coming to, to life, you know, those types of things. And did you even do like a table read prior to even, you know, I don't know what kind of workshopping you guys did for with the script to make sure that it was totally in order before you went into production? No, we did all of it. I mean, we did we did full on casting sessions uh, and you know, a lot of these actors are people that I'd worked with throughout the years or been friends with and things like that, or Ryan. Um, but we still had everybody audition because we wanted everybody from the team to feel really good about it before going in and it to never feel like, oh, well, that guy got this role because he was Rez's buddy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we, we, did a, we did a gruesome casting process. We were really, really serious about the casting from the get-go. And some of them were blind reads. And, you know, one of our leads, Amanda Clayton, was somebody that we got off a blind read. And Chris was recounting the other day, we had something like 700 submissions for that lead role, um, for the role of Amanda. And she was just so good. And we paid so much attention to that. We're really proud of the casting in this movie. Now, what she and, named, well, real quick, was she, uh, the character's name is Amanda uh, Morrison, and the actress' yeah. name is Amanda Clayton. So was the character written as Amanda prior to Amanda... Auditioning? The character was written as Amanda almost to the point where I think one of us brought it up and we're like, should we change the character name now that it's Amanda Clayton? And we're like, no, no, we gotta keep it because that's what it was from the beginning. Okay. But, no, it was there before. That was just fate. All right, there you go. <laughs> but, but yeah, uh, but to yeah jump we, were, we were gruesome about it. Yeah, I mean, we were, we took the casting so seriously, Scott. I mean, I think probably almost obsessive for a movie of this size on in the small frame, time frame that we had. But to me, it's made all the difference. I mean, we have some wonderful actors in the movie in this silly world that we created, and they really help hold it together. Um, and again, a lot of people were friends of Reza's, but, you know, I, I remember asking Reza, I'm like, dude, who's going to submit for this? Like when we put it online, you know, <laughs> on, on sites. And I was like, Reza, we're not going to be able to get anybody. What are we going to do? And he's like, dude, don't worry about it. We woke up the next day and there were like 600 submissions for the lead and 700 for the, the, the female lead. And I'm just like, it was a real eye opener to me to see how many people out there are doing it. Because I'm thinking like, dude, micro budget movie, you know, getting paid nothing. You have to leave L.A., come up to Ventura. But I was flabbergasted by the amount of people. And I love the casting process. That was really fun. I think as a writer with all this in my head, to start to be able to put faces to these characters was so exciting. And, and I, th I thought we had a blast doing it. And and we found a couple gems. I mean, Amanda Clayton's getting ready to be in a, a Martin Scorsese movie movie um with miles teller at the end of the year hmm. and we never would have got like six months later reza we never would have got her it's just great timing right totally and and you know scott just to throw in one last tip for t filmmakers on it when it comes to casting uh no matter what your budget is always try to go sag and i know sag is a huge pain to work with especially if you don't have a lot of dough but it really does it really does get you a different caliber of actor because most of them have become SAG at this point. And always, always pay your talent something. And we didn't have a lot. And, you know, we we're paying them more than 50 bucks a day or whatever that I've seen on some shows. Because either way, we have to meet the SAG minimum. But it's just worth it. It just really helps you. They're so important pieces. Don't just cast your buddies all the time and things like that. Yeah, let, yeah. Me, let me ask you, did you work with a casting director or did you guys just like, okay, we'll be the castings? director sessions we were the casting directors yeah. we just we did it all and again i was lucky enough to have to basically been having this roster in the back of my mind throughout all the years of some of the most talented actors that i worked with and people that i knew would be good for some of the roles as was so it gave us a really strong starting point 
Um, or again, Ryan, like Stacey Caney, who plays in the movie, she was really good friends with Ryan. Paul, who plays Serge in the movie, was really good friends with Ryan. But uh, but no, we we did it, and we paid close attention to literally every single role. Nice, nice. So you have because for other you know filmmakers listening, sometimes you know like if you have uh, you know money in the bank, any kind of money in the bank, that's a leg up in terms of like okay, it's legit. You know, we're casting. You know, to find you know good actors, like you said, going SAG. Um, I know, like you know, people are always trying to figure out, well, how do I get a name into you know my uh, my film or something like that. And sometimes it's just working as simple as just working with a casting director. If you have some money in the bank, you can have that casting director literally just put out a notice, like we're casting for this independent film with X amount of budget, and we're looking for name actors. And it's really weird, but in, in the industry, as you know, uh, Rez is like, boom, that thing goes out. You know, agents, their job is to look, you know, look at the breakdowns that come in and then they, they, totally. they start shooting out. And your production company could be bombarded with like actors that you've seen many times over. Like, oh, wow. Like, because there's a lot of a lot of famous sort of character actors that just they that's how they that's what they do. And even, you know, sort of up and comers. And then sometimes when that when that snowball start happening. Um, then you'll have named actors sort of come out of the woodworks that want to be part of your project that you didn't even, you know, ask for. So I, I'm no, just trying totally to, yeah. Risk, yeah. So I, I mean, wanna, that, oh, oh, sorry, sorry go, ahead. Go, go ahead. I was just going to say that, so that is sort of, uh, dispelling the myth of like, how do you find a name actor for your, your, your movie is like, sometimes like if you can have some sort of, again, cash in the bank or some collateral or some leverage, then you work like having worked with some sort of casting director that has the that's what they do their job is they're well connected to all the agencies so and they have the the ability to put out a breakdown um you'll get named actors they'll just come you know as long as you ha it's like you have a project so um i thought it was fascinating for you guys who are like yep we're gonna do it but we're gonna do it on our own and and really enjoy that process of because casting is an enjoyable process because it probably it's slowly sort of um pieces together the movie because you've probably seen the movie in your head in terms of after reading the script and you're like I, it must be fun to see somebody come in that you weren't quite thinking of but like they they just had something you're like oh what do yeah, you think I, we, what I, do you think we could put this guy in this part, part or something like that yeah, yeah. Our, our lead actor um was somebody that reza asked to come into audition uh, his name is alex klein he plays the character denton he's the main guy he holds the film down and when Aaron and I wrote it, we wrote a guy, our lead character, just things happened to him. You know, he wasn't very funny. Everybody around him was funny. And we kind of probably thought like a good looking guy, you know. Um, and uh, what ended up happening is Reza brought Alex in to read for this. And Alex did a bit where he actually put a lot of comedy into this scene that we had never kind of thought as a funny scene, if you will. And I mean, it just, it just changed everything, Scott. It's exactly what you said. Like Aaron and I looked at each other and say, wait a minute, what if our lead character is just as funny as everyone else? And suddenly we saw a totally different vision of him. Alex is a bit of a taller guy. Suddenly like, wait, he could be taller. Oh, he could actually, you know, bring something to this role that we didn't see. And I kind of think he almost transformed the role a little bit, Reza. I mean, don't you feel like it was, it was not what we were thinking. A guy yeah, came no, in. He, he a hundred percent brought something different and that was what made him jump and made him super fun with it. Uh, also to go back to what Scott was saying, you're a hundred percent right. I mean, if you, if you have any money to put aside for it at all, uh, try and attach a casting director because they, uh, you know, places like CAA won't return calls from you if they don't know who you are. But if you're just a guy who has a little bit of a reputation with them and a little bit of, um, again, contacts there, they can they can move doors that you wouldn't expect. And we just kind of got lucky to get some. I mean, not that we got gigantic names in this and maybe with one we could have gotten even bigger ones. But you're definitely right on that. Yeah. And, no. and we we were turned down by some uh, distribution companies based off the fact that they literally said, if you only had a name like this movie's funnier than we thought, it's shot better than we thought. It's just kind of missing that quote unquote name. And we had, we had a lot of interesting cameos, but they were more friendship based, right? Reza, I mean, those were people that we yeah. stalked and were friends with, but they weren't that caliber that would get somebody, uh, I don't want to say excited, but somebody willing to spend a few bucks to get the film, you know? Right. So where did the the this decision to start using a lot of these uh, former famed wrestlers uh, come in? Like, when, was that was always part of the script or was it during the casting process? 
that that was always something that I wanted from day one. I had this vision for the <laughs> two dads in, in it. I'm a huge wrestling fan yeah. uh, my whole life. And I had this vision for the two dads to be wrestlers. I just thought it was a cool gag. I just thought if people knew wrestling, they would think it was hilarious that, oh, the mean dad and the down on his luck, good dad, they're, they're wrestlers. Not in the script as characters, but the actual professional wrestlers. And But I also knew professional wrestlers come with a certain value. The wrestling community is incredibly supportive of anything that has to do with wrestlers. So that was the original vision. And then the the to get those guys was a, a bit of a wild kind of journey. It's probably too long of a story, but <laughs> we, we went through a lot of hell to, to make that happen, but it's paid off unbelievably because the wrestling community is, I would say the first place to kind of see the film. And they're the ones that are starting to spread the word saying, Hey, wait a minute, th- this is actually funny. Like I watched it because <laughs> I wanted to see diamond Dallas page or Jake, the snake Roberts or, or what ended up being God bless him. Roddy Piper's last film. Yeah. But I think they're, finding that it's actually a, a funny movie and it, it's great it's actually kind of worked out like you know i feel like a m- maniacal bad guy like Mwah, that was the plan but it was kind of the plan because wrestlers bring a certain audience with them that a lot of actors just don't have and we were able to sort of get some attention initially from that nice and uh, where was the um what was the first wrestler to buy in that helped sort of snowball everything uh, it was it was Roddy Piper. Oh uh, wow, you went okay. That's like <laughs> oh yeah, I, it, it's awesome, man. He was such a wonderful human being. Um, and he was a tremendous actor. I know he did a lot of B films, and, and he may take a little bit of flack, but he was a tremendous actor. Uh, one of the great regrets I think is that he wasn't able to be in a bigger budget film where he was able to really kind of show his stuff mm-hmm. in, in later years, but. Um, I cold emailed him. Um, I can't just out. It was a webmaster thing on his website. He, you know, <laughs> my heroes growing up. And he e- he emailed me back, um, was friendly as can be, said, hey, I'm in L.A. a lot. I'll give you a call. We can catch up. Two days later, I get a call from Roddy Piper. I'm losing my mind. I'm trying not to be a fanboy on the phone. Um, and he says, let's get together. We met in L.A. We had pizza. I told him all about the film. We totally bonded initially over Tom Waits and music. And I don't even think it was about the film. To be honest with you, I think it goes back to the investor conversation. Mm-hmm. I think he was so impressed by the passion and the insanity and the underdog nature of this that he said, hey, I'm in. I'll do it. I'll, I'll be one of the dads, you know let's let's make it happen Uh, he said call my agent reza got in touch with the agent and um that led to diamond dallas page who you know we contacted him he just wanted to be in a film with roddy Mm -hmm. he agreed to do it and then the tragedy of it to go really quick is um 72 hours before filming started i get a call from roddy and he got a call from vince mcmahon the wwe needed him to be on monday night raw he was not going to be able to make the film Hmm. I call Reza. I mean, we go into panic mode. I mean, this is your panic mode. We're filming in 72 hours and he was on day one. Um, We think we're going to lose Diamond Dallas Page. Uh, Diamond Dallas Page, to his credit, does not go. He tries to help us find another wrestler and it leads to Jake the Snake Roberts, who um, we were a little suspect of because there was, you know, we knew he was clean and sober and healthy. If if you're familiar with his career, he had uh, he had a bad substance abuse problem. But we weren't sure at what stage that was. So Reza said, we got to roll the dice. We need a wrestler. We booked his flight. And, and 48 hours later, we're on set with uh, Jake the Snake Roberts. And he was not even involved with the film 48 hours before that. Wow. He was awesome. He was incredible. And then to wrap it all back around, we're filming. We shot the movie in 13 days. We're going crazy. It's Gorilla. I get a call from Roddy just asking how it's going and apologizing for having to bail. I say, Roddy, would you just come up? Would you just come up and be in the film? And he says, you know what? Sure, no problem. I pick him up in L.A. I drive him. We're shooting a scene at my house. He uh, workshops a scene with our lead character really quick at my mailbox. <laughs> um, film it. Um, had a wonderful day. Bonded with him. Became friends. Long story there. But, uh, you know, we were obviously devastated to lose him last year. And oddly enough, I'm really proud of um, of all the things I'm proud of this film. It's that a guy that I grew up who was my hero, I got to help make 
the last film he was ever in. And and his daughter, who's a fine actress herself, Ariel Toombs, came to the premiere uh, two weeks ago and, and she loved the movie and she was really happy to see her dad in it. And, and that meant a lot because, I mean, again, you know, you could see this movie and be like, oh, my God, my dad's last film was about a gourmet condom company. <laughs> but instead she loved it and said that her dad loved the film and it was a wild experience. And again, uh, to go back to promotion and social media, having some different people like that in the film um, ha- has really been a blessing. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you say, Reza, if there's one community that has a, is getting us out there at first, it is the wrestling world. You know? Yeah, 100 percent. They've been they've been extremely supportive. That's amazing. I'm sure there's like a lot of just fun stories in terms of the whole production um, oh. and the emotions of just like you said, these are magical moments that you have with a fan, like a, a hero of yours. And then to be part of that, it's like that's something that nobody can take away from you and uh, this experience. I was curious because uh, I'm going to be mindful of your guys time. Um, so you get the film you know, finished wrap. It obviously takes some time. It's, you know, probably uh, developing into a film that wasn't quite what you expected because that usually happens, but that's fine because sometimes what transpires in front of you is like, okay, yeah, this is the film. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of fast forward a little bit to like now it's wrapped, it's done. Uh, when was the first, you probably had a couple different versions of the screening rough drafts and stuff like that, but, um, how many people were involved with sort of the watching the evolution of like sort of the first draft to where it is now before you released it? Um, it was involved in, it was definitely me, Ryan, Chris, Aaron, clearly. And then the, uh, the original editor who is Taylor, who was honestly incredible and gave so much of his time to this project. And, then from there, we started kind of showing it to like JD, who's one of the uh, who is somebody that Chris and Aaron knew back in Ventura. He was a filmmaker. He was really nice to kind of come in later in the game and kind of give an outside perspective. You know, it just gets tough because you get locked into all these cuts and you lose perspective on it. Yeah. So see something a thousand times and you're like, I don't even know what I'm trying to think of anymore. Um, but, you know, there was probably like seven people involved but really five of us, um, meaning the editor. Then later we had a second editor come on board again just to give a little bit of different perspective on it and help clean some things up. But yeah, there was like a total of seven or eight of us. And we we spent a long time in post, Scott, like a, like a sick amount of time, mm-hmm. like over a year. But it's really because we didn't have the money to charge things forward, but we still wanted it to be good. So people put a lot of either side time into it or things like that. Or there's like a lot of late night sessions, like we're up till 2 a.m. trying to figure something out. But, right. you know, it evolved a lot. Like if you saw from first cut to where it is now, it's just such a different beast. <laughs> and I wasn't prepared for that. I, I actually I to be completely blunt, since your podcast is a lot of honesty like that, like I was bummed. I, I was very new to the process. I didn't understand how long post was. We shot January, February. I'm thinking we're releasing this bad boy in the summer. You know, I'm thinking <laughs> yeah, yeah. three months from now we're on the road promoting the flick, man. And uh it was a real eye opener to me. But Reza always kept us grounded always said it's going to be a better movie because of this it's going to be a better movie um you know we we you know ran out of money we had a small investor that was going to help with post that ended up bailing so then you got to find money and it it post production definitely for me became quite the rabbit hole and Aaron and I were working on the music and Ryan and Reza were working on the edit and everything just took so long but the the point of me rambling on that is I'm so glad it did because the film is just such a better film now than it was a year ago. And we could have put it out a year ago, but everything would have suffered. And the fact that people are really impressed with the production and the sound and the music, that goes to the fact that we just decided to do slow and steady wins the race. And I really feel like it's made all the difference, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What's that saying? You can have it fast, cheap. Or good, but you got to pick two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so true, though. It's so true. There's no cheating that. Yeah. yeah. So except, what... for, except for women. Now, you know, I think. You know. <laughs> what do you, um, Reza, what was the, where was the, I guess, distribution plan of the market? What was, did you have an early plan or were you just like, let's just get this thing finished and I'll figure it out later? Or, I, oh, know? yeah, sorry. 
I was going to say, I had, a, I had an early plan, um, but it all changed. Like I said, my background is is in producing. I Like I mentioned, I'd done uh, a handful of films before that. But distribution in the last few years even has changed so much that it's like all the best contacts I'd ever had were like Hollywood and blockbuster video. And, you know, we can all laugh about, sadly, how that doesn't mean anything anymore. Yeah. So trying to figure out the digital distribution uh, – really threw us for a loop. I mean, the only thing that I knew to even do was go to a film market. I went to AFM, the American film market here in Santa Monica. Um, I had done AFM before under different levels. This was my first time kind of just crashing it as a guy with one movie. Um, And, you know, sent out meeting requests. That's the first step to it if you ever end up doing it. And it didn't drum up a whole lot of interest. I'm not going to lie. I mean, the markets are just such a big beast and there's so many movies that you're getting drowned out by that it didn't end up working like that. We did get, we did get a couple people who were interested, but we still want to get it out to people. And so Chris and I just kind of went renegade style. And this is something that anyone at home can do. If you have a movie is just spend a bunch of time researching. We researched literally every single distribution company on IMDb pro and just saw who has movies like ours that they've released in the last few years. Who's the last person who did a comedy like this? And we made big lists, and then we made contact lists based off of that. And even if some of them were like the info at so-and-so distribution.com, we just sent a ton of emails, and it's a numbers game. I mean, I probably sent out like 200 emails, and in the beginning got like two responses. (laughs) And then... uh, We were shocked at thinking how... it. Yeah. So we... from there, we uh, there wasn't the biggest key is if you're going to through distribution, everybody knows you send a trailer. Well, we didn't have any money left to make a badass trailer, and our fear was with a crappy trailer, we're just going to do the opposite where nobody's interested. Mm-hmm. So we threw together a little clip reel. We took three scenes that were picked on purpose one of them was the biggest production value scene from it like a big set piece with camera movement and all this stuff one of them was what we thought was one of the funniest scenes in it um and included jerry bednob who's one of our bigger names and then we just kind of threw in one that we just thought was funny in general and that started drumming us interest it got us a decent amount of responses and from there we had like honestly like seven or eight people interested in distributing the movie in the end of the day which is a huge achievement i feel like for a movie of our size yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, Chris, you were going to say something. Go actually, ahead. we had it. Well, we had 10, Scott. It's very important to me to get those <laughs> We had 10. But but the harsh reality, and I think this is where you were going to go, is um, it was a, sh- a shock to me um, that how different the, di- the indie distribution is because all the offers were offers to release the movie, but there was no – there was no money on the other end. I mean, nothing. I mean, I was stunned. Again, you're, you're talking to like a, a rookie that you could spend all this time and all this energy and make something and literally have people be like, we'd be happy to put it out. Um, but we <laughs> can't give you any money to do it, but we'll put it out. Like, and, and we met with all sorts of people that had all sorts of ideas. So it was kind of a wild ride at that point too as to what the hell do we do now? Yeah, I'm curious. I, you know, you know, Rez, you were talking about the American film market, and from my experiences uh, uh, being there, um, it, it, it is that th- this is for the other the filmmakers that are now listening out oh. there. Is the 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 distribution company's perspective is they need to collect as many titles as possible, and a lot of times they bundled it uh, to sell in packages, um, ideally to different markets or whatnot. Um, and you know, when you go to the American film market, a lot of times they want to see a trailer or, and if you're, if you have an, uh, an opportunity to show the film, they'll sit in for like the first five, six minutes of the film. Cause they're just trying to get a gauge, like, you know, really quick, like, okay, what's the production quality? Um, is the first five minutes sort of engaging or it gives me an idea of the quality of filmmaking within the first five minutes. And then they move on. Because whether, like you said, a lot of times the, the the distribution companies are not necessarily there to look to work hard. They're always looking. No. They're looking there for the sure thing. Like nobody when it works. Like so, you, even though you have a fine film, fine funny film, the reason they were asking for why does everybody want a certain name? Because it makes their job easier to sell it. You know, 
b across you know different markets, um, even though there might be a great film in front of them, uh, if there's any chance that they have to actually work hard, they won't. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know you're you're totally right. And you know the the other thing is again looking at how the market has changed. DVD was was easier to understand because you fought for shelf space. But if you got shelf space, everyone could wrap their minds around. All right, well, we'll probably turn us. X amount of units, you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. we're sitting on that particular shelf. But now your movie lives on a list and that's it. So it's like, well, how do people find a movie when shelf space doesn't exist anymore? And like you said, names help a bunch. So that's the first thing they try to grasp to. Well, yeah, sure. If this movie's great or funny or looks good, it doesn't do us any good if nobody ever sees it. So they kind of just skip over it. Um, and you can't really prove to people that you're going to have the back hustle if they don't know you. So the place that we got interest and it helped a lot uh, towards the end was, again, the wrestlers. Mm -hmm. The company started wrapping their minds around it and we had to start kind of force feeding it to them. We literally put together a marketing deck, um, a back end deck that was like 10 pages that said, here's everybody who's in the movie. You know, here's the people. Here's this value. Here's that value. Here's how we plan to kind of get people to see it, you know, like even putting social media followers and stuff on there. Or we also got lucky that the resurrection of Jake the Snake had just dropped. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know, that's a documentary with Jake and Diamond Dallas Page, and it did very well. And we literally screenshotted things and said, look at this. This is these two guys. That's it. No other names. We know it's a sports documentary, but look at how well it performed. And you kind of have to feed the story to people because, like you said, Scott, nobody does the work on the back end. They're not going to sit there and go, well, if I really think about it, you know, how does this thing happen? So right. that was it. Interesting. What kind of it, uh, this would be fascinating for other filmmakers to hear. But what sort of the feedback did you get from the various distribution companies that you're approaching? Uh, because this kind of gives us as a window of like what you know, kind of what their world is like. And like some, sometimes the stuff they say is like, I, I don't get it, you know? And, but uh, I was just curious. Cause I think those are, no, those no, are interesting stories for filmmakers to hear. Like what kind of feedback you would get. That's very, totally fair. I yeah, mean, the, the, the main feedback was always, you don't have names. That was the first feedback. And that was the first place that everybody kind of said there's no on was based on that. The second um, though, Reza, that is important is is no comedy. We ran into multiple mm -hmm. distribution companies that did not want to touch comedy. So it was scary at first, you know. Yeah, and, and there's and there's a reason for that that I was gonna get to is uh is some places don't want comedy because it doesn't translate overseas. And for those filmmakers out there who may not know this, you know, international, even for a no name movie is huge. I mean, that's still where a lot of their money comes in from. So if they think that's gone, then all of a sudden it's a scary thing. So we really had to drum up the belief that, you know, we'll get a lot of love from Northern America. We'll get a lot of love from Canada and the UK and English speaking places and more than a movie of our size, hopefully. And then it would kind of trickle in from international would just be a little bit of it. Right. So the, this the the back end on that. The reason again, filmmakers listening, why this whole why distribution companies are so hung up with like a name, you know, attached to your film. Um, it's sort of like the um, Zig Ziglar's like five basic or obstacles of anybody of any sale. So like just basic business. So somebody wanting to buy something from you, they have like uh, Zig Ziglar says there's five obstacles like. There's, uh, they have no money, they have no desire, they have um, uh, no time, uh, no trust, and like, um, I forget the fifth one. I should write, wait, I have it written out here. But, the, <laughs> but it's, uh, oh, let me, I'm sorry, guys, hold on a sec. Oh, here it is. Sorry. There's no, uh, every sale has five barriers. It's no need, no money, no hurry, no desire, and no trust. So the, that's why you see in the marketing side or like the distribution side, the name actor uh, eliminates this aspect of no trust because when a consumer is looking to look for a film um, and they see somebody they recognize that has some bankability, that, that helps alleviate that one obstacle. Now the, um, now the other four obstacles, the distribution company needs to, you know, design their marketing around that, which is why you see like, 
uh, limited time only, you know, whatever for sale, you know, for, for two weeks or sure. that, that, that's the no hurry thing. And then the, the, the no money thing is just simply finding out a nice sweet price point. And then the no need, no desire that's kind of goes hand in hand, but it's simply like, was there enough buzz built around it that uh, a consumer base would want it? But really that's the no trust aspect of it is really why distribution companies are always looking for a named actor because they don't want to work and it makes it easier for their work. And you mentioned the international side, which is where the a distribution company will, you know, try to get as many little sales as possible through all the various contacts they have um, that they've established so that your film can make a little bit money here, a little bit money there. When I say your film, it's usually your film bundled with, you know, 10 other films <laughs> yeah, yeah. that, you know, that's why you have to get as much money up front in the minimum guarantee as possible because, um, you know, you won't see anything in the back end because all those trips they go to Europe, they're, all those expenses that a distribution company uses to, to travel around the world to try to sell your film, uh, they're living up the, the life of luxury, so, you cool. know, kind of, but that's they're writing it off of like whatever they sell your film for, then if whatever four star hard tells they were staying at, they'll just write that off from your profits. So yeah. the comedy part of it was interesting, too, because you're right. The universal language. Uh, when I was hustling uh, my independent comedy um, at EFM, they told me, too, it's like, you know, honestly, a lot of these American comedies don't translate well overseas because simply because of the reason of uh, loss in translation in terms of jokes, you know, people not getting it. But the interesting thing, the number one uh, comedic star in the world at that particular time was Rowan Atkinson of Mr. Bean and Johnny English <laughs> because he never said anything because he's physical and physical sure. comedy translates across the world no matter what. So it is interesting that's the same thing. Not that it can't be done, but you can see where the, the distribution companies, one, you don't have a name, and two, it's comedy. They're like, well, that's too much work for me. <laughs> you're 100% you're right. And you know, just really quickly, uh, outside of the minimum guarantee, which is the most important part, the second most important part is actually negotiating a cap for those back-end expenses that nice. you were just mentioning. Because if you don't, and they'll never start with one, every distribution company, they'd be a fool to send you a contract that has one in there. But always ask for one, because if it's unchecked, God knows what that'll rack up to. Right, definitely. So th you go through this process. I'm curious of like, what was this, the final decision of the dis distribution plan? Or did you settle with a distributor? And I was really curious, how did you get your trailer, eventually when you were able to have enough funds to create a trailer, and how did you get it part of Fandango's um, YouTube channel? Because I know that when you sent me the link, I was interested. I was like, oh, wow, how did they, how did they get this part of the Fandango's uh, YouTube channel? Because uh, I thought that was a very important process. That's, so I that's... know that was two part. I'll let Chris answer the part on uh, getting the trailer to, uh, to Fandango. And also he'll, he'll build off of, uh, of what I'm about to answer. But as far as the distro companies went, like Chris said, we had 10 offers in the end of the day. Uh, one of the most important things to us was trying to get somebody who uh, who we thought could get on all the places that we needed to get to. And that kind of narrowed us down to just a few people in the end of the day. Like, all right, these are people, again, do research. We looked up what are the last five, ten movies that they release and where did these movies land? And that kind of narrowed it down to three people of like, all right, these guys have really big digital footprints. Like, they get their movies everywhere and we kind of knew our movie had to be everywhere in order to work um and we really went with screen media because obviously we had meetings with everybody but screen media seemed really cool down to earth and on top of that they don't release a ton of movies a month like some of the aggregators out there and that's by design it's not because it's not like because they can't get them people will hand you movies now but these guys kind of purposely only release two to four movies a month, and we like that. Because going back to what you were saying, Scott, if you're one of 15 movies that they're getting released that month, you're just getting lost in the shuffle so easily. So that was why we chose Screen Media in the end of the day. But um, I'll let Chris kind of answer the uh, the Fandango part because he had a big part to do with that. Well, the um, 
Yeah, uh, you know, and a, a little side note, really quick. Uh, you, you'll love this, Scott. But <laughs> we went we, we went out to lunch with one distribution company that was interested in us. It was myself, Reza, and Ryan, the director, and we had three uh, beer each, right, Reza? I think everybody. Yeah, had yeah, yeah. And at the end of the meeting, this guy is telling us how he's going to work our movie, and he wants it, and he loves it. And it was a company that's very established, but they do a lot of films. They put a lot out, <clears throat> so. He was basically trying to convince us why we wouldn't get lost in the shuffle. At the end, when the check comes, he looks at us and he's like, you guys cool to split it? And I just thought, like, it sounds stupid, but it was such a small thing that made me say, this isn't the place for us. Because if this guy really loved our movie, he'd pick up like a $22 check and buy the (laughs) the two beers, right? I'm like, man, this guy's not even buying beers, but he's telling us he's going to spend all this time on our film. It just... I know it sounds ridiculous, but there's little things like that that I think you have to keep your eyes open to, you know, like, Mm -hmm. you know, where's the extra 500 bucks for our movie if there's not $20 for beers? Because the poor guy probably is meeting with 30 different filmmakers. Like, you know, if he bought everybody a beer, he couldn't. So that was kind of I know that's random, but I just thought you'd get a kick out of that, you know, but the um, the uh, the trailer situation is really cool. You had mentioned when we got more money, we made a trailer. That's actually not true. Um, Reza made our trailer. He actually at a certain point just sat down and said, we got to have a trailer out on this guy. Right, Reza? I mean, yeah, there- and it was the intent was to be a teaser trailer. And I'm I'm not an editor, by the way, at all. But I had like this random idea for a trailer one night. And then the next day started putting it together. And then uh, one of my good friends who actually is good at editing came over that night and kind of cleaned it up. But that was it. It started just as like, "Ah, I'm going to try and make a 15 second thing. And then it ended up an actual trailer that we were happy with. And and not only did we use that trailer, the distribution company opted to use that trailer as well. They were like, this gets across what we need to get across. Uh, there's no need to make a bigger trailer. All they did to it, and you'll love this, is they slapped the wrestlers' names on their version of the trailer. So it's the same trailer. They just threw up Jake the Snake, Diamond Dallas Page, Roddy Piper, like on the actual screen. And that's mm-hmm. the one that's being used on um, uh, so the, how we got on Fandango, I, being new to it, I looked at trailers and I saw, I'm like, man, all, all the ones that are getting all the hits are the ones that are like via has that little Fandango F on it. It seems yeah, like kind yeah. of the de facto place and, and movie clips is their trailer um, website. Obviously, that's where, where they put all their trailers up different levels. They have like the indie section uh, and so forth. So um, we knew we needed to be on there. And this is one of these ones knowing somebody helps the friends of the friends asking around. This is going to sound crazy, but the bass player of my band, Army of Freshmen, is a gentleman by the name of Kai Dodson. Ready for this? Kai Dodson's wife works at Fandango. <laughs> so, 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 so we knew we needed to be on there because, you know, a movie looks smaller when you look at their uh, YouTube and the trailers put up by like if it said The Bet Productions or, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, you know, we wanted to be on that movie clip site. So Reza and I got a meeting with Kai's wife, you know, no problem. She's a friend. We sat down and we literally said to her, we're in the Fandango offices, probably the two smallest guys that have ever been in there, you know, and, uh, you know, people are pitching sponsorships and stuff. And Reza and I were in there just basically like, Hey, can we have some of that free iced tea that you have in the kitchen? And Oh, by the way, you know, you got, how do we get our trailer on there? And literally, I mean, Reza can attest to this. She was like, I just asked the guy in the next office, no problem. And (laughs) just like that, you know, our trailer got the launch on movie clips, you know, via the Fandango site and it's still there. And I think it's picked up so many more hits and it made the movie look um, like a bigger movie because of the fact that that little freaking F was in the right hand lower corner. Yeah, yeah. no, I definitely about, noticed it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just to just to give a takeaway to filmmakers out there, because in in case your bassist doesn't happen to be married to somebody from Pandango, <laughs> but uh, if you know, just hit people up. It's it's the old school thing. But before we had the meeting with Fandango, I had actually hit up the second largest movie trailer site and said, "Hey, we have we have a trailer coming out. Would love if you'd put it on, kind of thing." kind of expecting never to hear back. And they actually did write back to me. And because of the Fandango hookup, we actually ended up going with Fandango and we only wanted our trailer living on one place. Yeah. But just write people. I mean, it's 
to get your trailer up gets them hits, which gets them a few bucks from advertisement. So they might be more open to it than you think. Yeah, there's a there's an art to like they teach like entrepreneurs it's of simply just ask. And yeah. uh, like there's a there's this little test they do for people that are scared to do something like that is like when you're in line at Starbucks, when you you're about to pay your 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 check or whatever for the coffee, your latte, just simply ask, hey, can I get a 10 percent discount? <laughs> <laughs> just they'll say what? No. But what it is, is the idea is that sometimes it's comfortable to ask. And I remember just doing this for just fun. I remember we were at a hotel with my family. And as we're checking in, I just, you know, and to embarrass my wife and kid, I just said, hey, this is a really special night for us uh, this weekend while we're here. Is there any extra things you can do for us? That's it. All these men ask. And then, boom, we got like like free chocolates and like a like a champagne or something was sent to our room. Like it was just because I asked. Sure. <laughs> well, man, that's honestly that's the story of the creation of the bet. Like we were just willing to ask from locations to catering. We did a crazy catering plan to the financing to getting the wrestlers. I mean, literally just ask. I mean, we're a classic example of that. You know, you'll get turned down a lot. But that one time. Doors fly open, and it's working right now with the publicity of the film. I mean, Reza and I are handling the entire publicity campaign, and we're speaking to a lot of people. We're getting some great interviews, and a lot of it is just literally asking these people, not thinking that you're too small to be on it. You know? Yeah, definitely. I was curious with your when you went with Screen Media. Um, I'm always fascinated because you have the dis distributors the distribution company and they, they were like okay we get your placement and i know that uh the bet is now on itunes it's is it still or is it sure. pre-order uh no it's it's out it's out okay on it's iTunes. okay so um when you're doing all your research um what was the deciding factor to say okay i'm gonna go with screen media as a distribution company but as opposed to just going to an aggregator yourself to get placement on itunes and google play and hulu and things like that did the um, was it you know I was just curious because sometimes no, no, it's a it's a it's a really good question and again those those exist now I mean there's what is it distributor or something like that where you can just kind of go on and you pay a fee Bitmax distributor yeah all of that yeah yeah, yeah they they kind of get you on whatever platforms you're looking for um, you know the reason we went with Screen Media again was was from looking into where their movies landed. And they just get their movies on so many more places than just your standard aggregator can. Like we're like you said, we're on Google Play, we're also on Xbox, we're also on PlayStation, we're on like eight streaming platforms right now, or VOD platforms. And then we're also on like Direct TV, we're also on Time Warner Cable, we're also on all these things that we just wouldn't have the reach to get to. Gotcha. And you kinda need somebody with those resources to do that. Plus you have to think the back end of things. You know, we obviously are hoping to get on Netflix. We're obviously hoping to get some pay TV deals. We obviously are hoping to get a little bit international, things like that. Uh, it was just more important to us to do that. And on top of that, you're part of the screen media family. And when I, I'm, I'm looking at the, the site right now, and it'd be great if you, because they have like under the tab, like domestic, and you know, that's where they're pushing it. Sure. But your, your film is like right next to a film. Uh, with Emma Watson in it, you know, yeah. uh, and yeah. and like uh, there's other films in there um, that I see. Darling, uh, it's like a horror film that's being pushed on iTunes quite a bit. So almost like taking a screen grab uh, and or maybe kind of manipulating a little bit of the screen grab to show your film alongside all these other other films, part of the screen media family to say, and, and yeah, it's interesting. That was one of the things that jumped out for me from screen media. I was aware of them because they did a comedy called Back in the Day mm -hmm. um, that I had seen a couple years ago, and it got a lot of attention at the time. And I had always kind of remembered that name. So oddly enough, it was one of the first names on the list. But you, you're right. There is an association. They have an Emma Watson movie. They have a the Helen Hunt's directorial debut. And there's a certain smoke and mirrors that essentially makes our film look a little bigger because the company has films that have, you know, incredible actors and, and directors. And I think we like that a lot. Right, Reza? It was like, yeah, wow. absolutely. And, you know, a lot of what you're doing every time you do a movie is you're thinking of the next movie already, right? Yeah. So you're like, how am I how am I getting the next movie on the ground? How am I growing as a filmmaker? How am I getting more money? And even going to investors in the future and saying, hey, you know, this distribution company 
picked us up or you know if you have an industry meeting quote unquote whatever to say oh yeah our movie went out with screen media who also released this and that there's a little more cachet to it than like oh yeah i went on an aggregator and got on itunes because everyone can do that so the feeling kind of is oh well if screen media picked you you did something right and i don't even need to see your movie per se because somebody else already did that for me does that make any sense yeah no i mean definitely i can see like you guys are looking the bigger picture like the down the line um just real quick i was looking at your poster real quick who came up with the uh marketing tag screw your past um i think that was me actually not to take <laughs> credit for something but <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's really funny because it's like that's perfect <laughs> yeah uh, you can correct me if i'm wrong chris but i'm almost positive that was me but yeah yeah it absolutely was you yes yeah, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was yeah, was... great, great, great contribution to society at yeah, large. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I would be conscious of your time, but I want to kind of wrap this up for you guys. Yeah. So what, well, um, no, no, Scott, oh, yeah. I want to say is I do feel that things are changing Um, in, in my limited experience. I feel like there is a seismic shift happening with indie film distribution. And I do feel places like distributor are only going to get more powerful because there's nightmare stories with these uh, distribution companies out there. We're not in one, thank God, but everybody that we talked to, other filmmakers, producers, it was horror story after horror story. And I feel like there's almost like a subconscious revolt happening because you're now able to get on a lot of these platforms. And the the documentary that Diamond Dallas Page and Jake the Snake did, The Resurrection, mm -hmm. um, which we mentioned earlier, they opted to go distributor because they already had large fans fan bases right. and they were still able to end up on iTunes as well. So, I mean, I know you can touch base on this Rezo, but it's, they, they it's, got on Netflix as well. You mean, uh, yeah. yes, Netflix. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just, uh, I do think things are changing and it, like a lot of the distribution options. I mean, we were on the fence to doing it ourselves if we didn't end up going with screen media because we just weren't happy with what was out there. And we just hear bad story after bad story and a lot of disappointed filmmakers. So I feel I feel like there's a seismic shift happening. That may be too extreme. Yeah, I mean, Scott, we can have a whole podcast about that. <laughs> yeah. There's so much to say. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And also, yeah. you know, your your experience in the music industry, you know, that Chris, like that is interesting also, like how that parallels. So you've already seen it happen in the music industry to see the, the film industry uh, go through that same shift now. Um, it's deja vu, man. I, I tell people that I was on a sinking ship of music and a ship was passing by called Indie Film. And I said, I'll get on that one. And then I got on the boat and I said, can I talk to the captain? And it's Reza, you know, he's got the beard with the you know, the pipe, you know, like he's an old whaler. And he's like, this boat's sinking too, son. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, but yeah, I see a lot of, a lot of similarities of that period right before the music industry got bad and everybody decided to do it on their own as in, hey, you're not going to be able to make money, but it's easier to do it and you'll be able to put your own stuff out. God knows if anybody will see it. I, I definitely feel similarities there. And not to leave the conversation on a negative note, yeah. but you think things are changing. You know, I think uh, this film was a little bit of the exception. We sort of um, got to play the game that people played two, three years ago. Um, but I, I feel like it's different. I don't know if you feel that way as well, Reza, but. It's it's very different, yeah. <laughs> but it's but, also exciting. I mean, there's with with change also comes opportunity, and you just you have to be clever and kind of think ahead. And I can't I can't push enough. You have to think about how are people going to see this? Like, you know, is there somebody you can even partner with afterwards? Like, if you can if you're going to write a movie about soda, this is a really bad example. But if you're writing a movie about soda, start reaching out to soda companies and say, hey, I'm trying to make this movie, and maybe once we do it. We can do like a little cross promotion with each other from now and I'll put all your soda in the movie, but you put us up on something. You know what I'm saying? It's oh, yeah. it's all about how do you bring eyes now? That reminds yeah. me of the, the case study they did of a documentary. The film was literally called A Film About Coffee because <laughs> they, they went on Google Analytics and figured out like what people are searching for. So it's it literally in the title that's searchable and then did all their premieres at like coffee houses because – you know, <laughs> instead of doing like a movie theater, it was here's a, at a coffee house and then boom, right there. You can um, parlay into drinking coffee, sharing coffee. It's it's just fascinating. Anyway, I'm oh, sorry, Chris, you were going to say something. Makes so much sense. 
Oh, no. I mean, everything Reza said, I mean, connecting dots, thinking outside the box, trying to find ways that your film will – because how the hell do you get anybody to watch it? You can make just a great piece of art and a great film. But, I mean, I just don't think signing with the distribution company suddenly means people are going to see your movie. I mean, I just don't believe that. There's tons of movies with small distro deals that you never hear about. So – our twist was was the wrestlers but with that hopefully people are finding out that it's a funny movie and if that was our objective to make a funny comedy which it was from day one it wasn't to make a wrestling movie but the wrestlers have helped bring people to the film and i think people need to be conscientious of that because the idea that you get an indie distro deal and now people are going to see your movie i just don't think that exists anymore no one's walking the aisles of blockbuster and grabbing stuff like that there's it's a flooded market so you really have to try and find a different way to to bring people to the fray yeah yeah so what is your as we wrap this up what is your uh like three month uh goal plan and uh and for the rest of the year at the end of the year so you got three to almost like six month plan um what do you guys have planned for yourself and the film well for the film i mean our goal is basically you hit the nail on the head three months we wanted to work um from release from the point of release to the point of slowing down a little bit three months of just unabashed grassroots diy publicity you know talk to every podcast that wants to talk to us on um, do any interview that we can do get our cast members any opportunities whatsoever hand-to-hand combat I'm, I'm working part-time at a water booth at a county fair and i'm handing out flyers i mean it's literally we just want to slow and steady because this movie doesn't have to happen in the one week of release you know it just came out we're not theatrical we can do a slow one person at a time. We want to have a cult movie. We want people to just one person at a time find out about this. And so far that seems to be happening from the social media response to the the growth on the trailer. So, I mean, literally it sounds crazy, but we're going to do everything under the sun for three months to try and get people to find out about this movie. We made it very clear from day one. And I told Reza a hundred times, I'm like, we're not going to be one of those movies that just, it comes out and then you don't do anything and pray people see it. Like we have to put that work in. And I think that goes, back to my indie music background of you hop in a van you take it to the people and we're essentially trying to do that so it's just going to be a lot of hardcore publicity on our own and we'll see if we can uh, kind of get this thing to uh to pop for lack of a better word yeah nice it's definitely the hustle <laughs> yes. Yes. and uh Absolutely. i remember and, there's a story rob sir there, there's a story where someone who was like trying to get everybody to come see his movie at the local theater and he was he felt like he was just overdoing it on facebook and twitter and talking to all his friends and family like he was exhausted of like all this time spent trying to promote promote get people to the theater and like and he was worried that he was doing it too much when the night of the the movie premiere he's standing there greeting everybody that's coming in and he sees like an old friend of his. Oh, he's like, oh, thank you so much, man, for coming. He's like, yeah, well, I didn't, what's going on? I'm here to see like, you know, Star Wars. <laughs> like he had no idea. Like he had no idea his friend had a whole movie. Like, and that's the whole funny thing about it is like every time we think we're doing so much and too much or annoying everybody, the reality is like your best friend can still be like, oh, I didn't know you're doing that. <laughs> Dude, you couldn't you couldn't be more right. You literally, you just summed it up at that. You just discussed my life right now because I feel like annoying <laughs> All my friends and my family, like, dude, shut up. Every day, new podcast. Every day, new dumb little thing. But the thing is, that is a point zero 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 one percent of the population are people in your immediate circle, right? And I think, and uh, Reza may disagree with me here, but I live up in Ventura. I come from New Jersey. Reza is an LA guy. Rolls with LA dudes, and <laughs> a lot of those guys down there. And I would say this to other filmmakers. I think LA has a bit of a They don't want to annoy anybody. They don't want to send too many texts. They want to protect their relationships. Like some people down there that I've encountered, I think are incredibly talented, but they're not great at the publicity side of it because they're either beaten down or they're sort of afraid to annoy and offend people. Um, And I, I think that that's that's a mistake. You know, like you have to go out there and just go, 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 go. Because what other shot do we have at this? I mean, for me. Hopefully it's not the only film I make, um, but I don't want the first one to disappear and look back in a couple months and say, I should have sent more texts. I should have sent more emails. And I feel a lot of people down there do that. I have filmmaker friends that it's like, 
why aren't you working your movie harder? You spent so much time doing it and now you're kind of letting it disappear. I just, that, that sort of surprises me. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I'm sorry, Reza, you were going to say something. Oh no. I, uh, I was actually just going to say it building off what Chris was saying. Um, it really is just about spreading your word out there to, to get it to people and moving outside of LA always helps. So it's like, if you're from somewhere else and you move to LA, hit up all your buddies from back home because they do strangely care more. It's like, if you do live in LA, you have 15 Facebook messages or emails a day from somebody saying, Hey, I've got this show tonight. Hey, I've got this thing coming out. Hey, please watch this. Please watch that. Uh, so use your outside resources. The other thing going on back to that three month, six month plan is like Chris said, it's a slow burn, but we already have to start thinking of the next platforms. It's like we're working with Screen Media, obviously, to hopefully get on Netflix, hopefully get on Hulu and these different SVOD or subscription VOD platforms that are out there to just keep people watching it. Yeah, definitely. Do you think that, um, I don't know, There's we can go down a path, but I want to kind of wrap it up for you guys. I know we're going an hour and a half and let you guys go. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I, I learned a lot. I did and, too, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Well, you, you have such a feel for it. You really understand it and get it, and you clearly have a passion for it. And seriously, Film Trooper, I think, is one of the best film podcasts out there. I actually listen to it, so I, I really do appreciate what you do. Hey, thank you guys so much. And but well, we can't leave you know the audience not knowing where to find the bet. So <laughs> it's is the best place to find it is the bet movie twenty sixteen dot com. Is that it? Yes, yeah. and you can. Find us on all the socials at the Bet Movie 2016 Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're updating it daily with things that are happening and all sorts of cool ads. Um, and then uh, to you know, Reza, do you want to talk about really quick some of the things that you have in the works? Because you know, I was, we're, we're... I was just going to say really quickly, the socials are definitely better to follow us only because we update those a lot more often than the website. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, so follow us on any of the socials across Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter at the bet movie 2016 and and to see the film um you know you can any uh cable on demand just go to the movie section search the bet we're on itunes we're on fandango now we're on voodoo we're on xbox we're on playstation and the dvd will be coming out at the end of the month so um we're, we're basically anywhere there's digital movies and again i'm sure people hear the concept of this film some of your listeners and they're like man that is just not up my alley <laughs> i understand that i respect that no problem but what i would say is i think the film is worth seeing simply based off after hearing the story of how this was made I really think this is a great example of what you can do on a micro budget. I mean, at the very least, you could watch this in a film school and say, hey, forget the plot if this ain't for you. But look at the quality that these guys have achieved and look what they put together on a, a virtually a non-existent budget. I mean, this is legitimate hustle and blood, sweat and tears. And I, I think it's a, I think it's almost a feel good story and gives people a little bit of hope that you can have an idea in your head and you can ultimately get that idea idea on a screen but you got to put those steps together in between yeah. nice and i will add one more thing if any listeners or you decide to watch this in itunes leave a customer review because any of that kind yeah. of stuff helps oh, all please. the time so yeah absolutely in, unless you didn't like it then you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can go back to doing whatever you were doing before caveat yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you how, how cruel the film world is. All these like armchair critics and whatnot. We got our first review on IMDb, and we can be blunt about this, you know. Like literally at the end of it, it says, "Whoever wrote this, if they spent more than ten minutes on it, should go work at Burger King." Oh <laughs> my god, it's so brutal. I'm just like, all, you know, like like my soul's ripped out and crushed, you know. And then I'm thinking like, no, we got to use this in an ad, put it on Instagram, and and put the quote, and then put jokes on you it took nine minutes to write <laughs> i love it that is brilliant and you know what it, it's to stand out like you know because it's actually it's funny um a movie a movie doesn't have to be good or bad it just has to have value and like that that's like the, the famous like the worst film ever made like the, the room yeah. or whatever it was called like people <laughs> gather around uh you know go to you know showings of that movie in a the theater because they want to have they know it's supposed to be bad but they are having an audience experience because it, it gives them value. And so it's in terms of like business stuff, you know, whatever you have, it, it's not about good or bad. It's about value and the value you guys offer 
obviously with the uh, wrestling community and people that are into this stuff, like I could totally see a quote like that working for you in terms of your promotion, you know? <laughs> well, and also, you know, if you, if you go to our, if you go to our socials, uh, a conscious effort that everybody behind the socials made was the movie doesn't take itself too seriously. So the socials can't either. And we tried to make it fun, you know, like there, again, there's, there's different people behind it, but a lot of it is just goofy or like, honestly, even like self deprecating jokes on the movie itself. Like somehow before the movie even came out and anybody could see it, it got a 0. 0.05 rating on, uh, on voodoo somehow, like almost like by a fluke or something. <laughs> so we screenshotted that and started blasting it on the socials being like, we're so proud that the movie can't get any worse than it already is like stuff like that. So <laughs> it's, it kind of speaks to the voice of the film yeah. and lets you know what's going on with it. Oh, that's fantastic. That's just fantastic. All right, gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to let you guys go. Thank you very uh, this... much, Scott. It's a blast, man. We'll uh, yeah, thanks. have to do and some Scott, other time. For anybody listening, if they'd uh, like to get in contact, uh, Reza's company is uh, – you want to tell them real quick, Reza, about your situation? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll leave it brief because I know you got to go as well, Scott. But it's uh, it's Balding Penguin is the production company. Mm -hmm. and uh, And you can see a lot of projects coming out hopefully in the next year. But – if you follow me on Twitter, I'm I'm horrible at tweeting, so forgive me for it, but you'll find updates every once in a while. It's just my name, at Reza underscore Riazi, R-E-Z-A for the first name, R-I-A-Z-I -I for the last name, Reza underscore Riazi. Yep, nice. and same situation. I'm on Twitter, at Army of Freshmen, and the company that Aaron and I have put together is Goldie J Productions, and we have another film that we're looking to try and make next year. So hopefully from uh, both our directions, we'll have more projects in the future and be able to talk to you more, Scott. That'd be awesome. Total. And I'm so sorry. I know that we're going, but uh, somebody who deserves a special shout-out is both Aaron Goldberg, who's a co-writer, co-producer on the movie, and then Ryan Edder, of course, who was – the director of the movie who uh, I've teamed up with and we're doing some more projects as well. And you'll see the four of us do some stuff in the future too. But I uh, just want to make sure their names got mentioned. That's really cool. You guys, congratulations and the best of luck man. on the bet and uh, all, all the fun journeys and all the fun stories that can come from all this stuff. Cool. Really Thank appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bye, guys. Thanks for yeah, have a great one, man. And that concludes my interview with Chris J and Reza Riazi of the new film, The Bet, and you can find The Bet at thebetmovie2016.com. And if you like this episode, think about leaving a ratings and review over at iTunes. Just go to filmtrooper.com forward slash iTunes. It'll take you to the iTunes page and just leave an honest rating and review of the show. And it's all very helpful. So thank you so much for those of you who have left a ratings review in the past. And of course, don't go away empty-handed. I offer you a free gift over at freegearguide.com where you can get an equipment list of everything I used to make a feature film with no crew. Again, that's at freegearguide.com. Thanks for tuning in. I'll check you next time. Film Trooper. Filmmaking freedom for the independent.